Okay, greetings everyone. This is Peg Brady at the NOAA Library in Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, welcome to our monthly series on e ecosystem-based fisheries management. Um, this is um, held on the second Wednesday of each month. Uh, we took a break in August, but uh, we're resuming today with Mike Fogarty speaking from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center where he works in Watoll. The title of his talk is Towards Operational Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Management on George's Bank. Uh, we, I'll announce the speaker that we have for next month, but I do also want to make one note for folks that might be interested. Uh, today is a deadline for abstracts uh, with respect to ecosystem-based management at a session that's being held at the Ocean Sciences 2020 meeting in San Diego in February. But today's the deadline, and the title of the session is The Benefits of Ecosystem-Based Management for Sustainable Oceans and Blue Growth. And uh, we're getting quite a number of uh, abstracts submitted, but I just thought this might be an audience that would be interested in that session that we're hosting in February uh, 2020. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact me, Peg Brady at NOAA.gov. Again, uh, today's speaker, Mike Fogarty. Thanks, Mike. Uh, you're joining us from Woods Hole today, and uh, we'll turn the presentation over to you now. We have quite a number of folks here in Silver Spring, and there's quite a number of folks on, joining us online. So we'll take some questions after Mike's presentation and uh, uh, share that with Mike and uh, have an exchange uh, as it close of this talk. So thank you. Mike, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much, Peg. I wanted to take this opportunity to um, fill you in on um, where things stand with moving towards ecosystem-based fishery management in the New England region. I'm going to give you an overview of core elements of the approach that we're looking at um, with the New England Fishery Management Council. Uh, I'd like to say uh, that, in fact, what I'll be talking about, even though I'm presenting, is a re very much a team effort and wouldn't be possible without the contributions of my colleagues at the Ecosystem Dynamics and Assessment Branch here at the center, and also the EBFM plan development team of the New England Fishery Management Council. So this is a familiar statement to all of you, the um, EBFM definition from our policy statement, uh, but it's very germane to the, a number of the issues I want to raise today. Uh, the underlying parts of this statement in particular, uh, I'm going to be talking about a very uh, specifically place-based approach. Uh, we're going to be looking at resilience and sustainability as core elements of the objectives that we'll have. Uh, we're going to be looking at the interrelationships among the different parts of the system and ways of coping with that complexity. Uh, so we'll be dealing with that issue in a very special way. And of course, we're going to be looking at humans as an integral part of the ecosystem. Uh, Ecosystem-based fishery management um, began first in, with the New England Fishery Management Council in uh, 2010 with the establishment of a uh, plan prepared by the uh, Scientific and Statistical Committee of the, of the um, Council to move forward with laying out a strategy for considering options for ecosystem-based fishery management. Uh, from that time, it went through fits and starts because of different crises and, and issues that the Council had to contend with along the way. Um, but uh, the committee, uh, the PDT, was uh, reestablished in 2015. And uh, we had a um, statement from the council about what they hope to see in the development of an example fishery ecosystem plan, specifically for George's Bank as a prototype. And you'll see that uh, a couple of core elements of this is it's actually not simply asking for a descriptive overview of ecosystem properties on the bank, but really delving into fundamental properties and dynamics in the system that would lead towards the development of prescriptive management advice. Um, the last sentence in this statement probably will also catch your eye. Um, we were told that uh, we shouldn't be unduly constrained by current perceptions about legal restrictions or policies. Um, I think we all know that we um, have to be quite careful about that overall because of the importance of uh, not only conforming to Magnuson but also the national standard guidelines. So that will be part of the discussion uh, today. Um, there are six main elements that I want to tell you about today, um, 
include the actual def definition of the place-based management units, um, a next part determining the fishery production potential that relates to this issue of energy flow uh, and productivity that you saw in the statement in the directive from the council. Um, we're going to be defining fishery functional groups in a very specific way to try to really cope with both the technical and biological interactions that are so important in this area as in a way is trying to actually cope with some of that complexity in a very different way than we typically had in this um, region in the past. Uh, we're dealing with um, the specification and identification of uh, management procedures uh, to go along with this process. Uh, that will really form the decision rules or, or inform the decision rules that we'll be dealing with. Uh, to further that end, we've developed a number of different operating models. So I'm very um, fortunate to be working with a very erudite uh, group of individuals in our branch, and you can see they're well versed in uh, Roman, Greek, and Norse mythology. So we have two models, uh, one named Hydra, the other Kraken. I suppose we could, uh, although we can't claim the name, Atlantis is in that same mold. Uh, and then we'll also be um, developing operating models with a newly expanded version of Ecopath with Ecosim. And then finally, I'm going to give you some information on preliminary tests of the management procedures and looking at uh, overall performance levels. Uh, all of this is by way of a pre uh, prelude to moving towards a full management strategy evaluation in the next phase of this overall process. Um, before I tell you about these um, six elements, though, I want to provide a bit more context that deal with issues, some very fundamental and basic issues in terms of the ecosystem itself, the fishery, the management procedures, uh, that are the management actions and, and plans that are in place now. Um, so you'll have a context about uh, some of the core issues that we're grappling with in the region and uh, uh, really why we're trying to uh, frame a different approach to the problem overall. So first, um, in terms of acquainting you with the geography, uh, I think many of you um, have heard of George's Bank. It's a shallow submarine uh, plateau uh, located off the New England coast. I'm sitting right here in Woods Hole. Uh, there are a couple of place names that may come up in the course of the of the discussion, however, that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, George's Bank is separated by two important channels, a very deeply incised uh, northeast channel going into um, the Gulf of Maine proper, a conduit for different water masses, uh, both from the north and south. Um, and typically the lower boundary of George's Bank is defined by this Great South Channel, a much shallower, uh, but nonetheless important, uh, geologically and ecologically important dividing line. But as you, you'll see as we move on that actually um, the approach that we've taken really points to a connection uh, and a similarity in some very key ways, not only between George's Bank proper, but Nantucket Shoals listed there. So you'll see that emerge in the discussion as well. Uh, one of the most important things about uh, this area, of course, I think perhaps everyone knows there's a centuries long history of exploitation on the bank, but uh, one of the really important events occurred in, started in 1961 with the arrival of distant water fleets off our coast, operating not only on George's, but but largely in that area um, from fleets from the former, principally from the former Soviet Union. Um, under that massive input of fishing effort and fishing pressure, we experienced a sequential decline, a serial depletion of quite a number of the stocks here. You're looking at here, uh, not individual species, but um, functional groups of species, just to, to simplify things a bit. Uh, the red demarcation point, uh, the vertical line, it separates um, the um, pre-200 mile limit activities to those that, that came in, into play with not only the adoption of the 200 mile limit, but also the establishment of the council system. So you can see that uh, we were working uh, from the inception of the council's initiatives in a, a system that had been very hard hit by fishing pressure by the foreign fleets overall. Um, we're also fortunate to have a very extensive history of ecosystem research on the bank, uh, including a number of different uh, energy flow um, 
analyses. In fact, the earliest and simplest was in, published in 1946 um, by colleagues at, at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And since there had been a progressively uh, in detailed treatment of energy flow and productivity on the bank overall, this particular diagram I'm showing you uh, came from uh, some work about a decade ago, led by Jason Link, looking at the development of energy flow models, not only on Georgia's, but in adjacent areas uh, on the Northeast Continental Shelf. Um, more recently, Sean Lucy has developed and expanded in a development of uh, energy flow network models for Georgia's Bank um, that uh, as part of his dissertation research. But you can see that um, there is quite a, a, a extensive database that we're drawing on to identify the energy flow patterns and uh, the dynamics in the system overall. Currently, the management structure um, uh, under the New England Fishery Management um, Council has a number of distinct uh, management plans. And you'll see that in a number of them, there are um, several species, uh, in the case of the groundfish plan, quite a number of species that are bundled together. However, in any one of these plans, there is no real um, consideration of the interactions among the species uh, in, the, in those plans. Uh, and perhaps more importantly for some of the things I'm going to want to say, um, there's no consideration, direct consideration in the current management of strong interactions among species covered under separate management plans. So we have really the strong uh, possibility of having unintended consequences overall by treating these different species either within the plan or between plans as actually operating independently of the ecosystem. And then I'll finally, I'll just also point out that uh, we have um, in the skate complex that you see to the right of the screen, um, treatment of a, uh, a group of species collectively. So the individual species, although they are assessed through uh, survey analyses separately, uh, the plan is for the entire complex. And similarly, uh, in the, the center um, box, silver hake and offshore hake are treated as a species complex. So we've got a pretty complicated uh, story in terms of how the management actually unfolds in the area, both in terms of uh, how species are treated individually and the extent to which we currently have uh, species complex is an important part of the story. Uh, it's also important for me to tell you that even though we live in a very data-rich part of the world, um, a very substantial number of the stock assessments, uh, we do more than 50 stock assessments here uh, for species, um, the, the highest portion of those are index-based assessments that are based on survey information catch or some integrated combination of those. The second uh, most important group is in age-based assessments and then fewer both in length and other um, uh, uh, categories in terms of assessment types. But this really uh, frames the problem in terms of the types of assessment models, multi-species and ecosystem assessment models we can use uh, given the differences in the types of availability, the detailed availability of information on different species groups. Um, one of the things that I'll be dealing with um, pretty substantively in this is, is one of the things that I believe are causing is at the heart of some of the difficulties we have in management in the area. And I'll, right now, I'll point out that there are on uh, in the New England area 15 stocks that are classified currently as of June 30th as uh, overfished. So it is a substantive problem. Um, although there can there are a number of potential important factors controlling and affecting that. Um, what is undeniable, particularly with the, um, the groundfish complex and other uh, species that are caught with the groundfish, is that the mixed species nature of the fishery, where we have very important technical uh, interactions occurring. And also, uh, we know from the food habits data that we've collected now for decades that there really are quite strong multi-species interactions among some of the parts of the system. So this statement by Robert Thorpe in 2017 is just one of a, a group that I could have selected from, uh, but it, it points out the very uh, problem that's really experienced worldwide in terms of dealing with fisheries of this type overall. And in particular, trying to think about the problem as if there were individual FMSYs uh, for species when in fact they're really part of an interacting complex. 
So the one way to think about that problem is in the uh, simplest way is first to understand that um, we do have some quite strong um, uh, predation mortality terms. Here's a, a group of six species and they're arrayed by age class in this case with the uh, blue at the upper end, the youngest age class at age one. You'll see that in many of these, not only is the um, uh, natural mortality rate on the younger ages potentially quite high for, for a number of these, but it's also time varying. So it's not a constant as we typically think about in uh, single species assessments um, currently in this area at least. Uh, one of the issues in terms of understanding the interplay between the uh, different interacting species is, and this goes back to the point of not being able to specify a single, for example, fishing mortality, FMSY, um, for an individual species. It's really contingent on the uh, factors affecting interacting species. So here's perhaps the simplest possible way I could depict this using uh, a predator-prey interaction. And you can see that now uh, we no longer have a single uh, point or slice through this surface, but rather a highly, uh, potentially highly dynamic uh, movement on a surface where depending on what's happening to the interacting species, it affects what we could expect for um, optimal fishing mortality rates on the component parts. So I'll close with just a couple uh, more points about background. Um, some of the problems that I've just been mentioning were recognized early on, right from the very inception of the council's activities. The council formed a Northeast Fishery Management Task Force, and in 1980, the task force delivered a number of uh, different reports on different aspects of the challenges facing the council. And uh, one of the things they highlighted um, is an approach to really uh, trying to cope with some of these issues that relate very specifically to the technical and biological interactions uh, that I mentioned. And they talked about um, setting um, both target levels and understanding productivity and harvest potential for the entire ecosystem uh, with the idea that that ecosystem has greater overall stability than any of the components and also, of course, quite importantly, that it's really important to uh, preserve the integrity of the overall ecosystem. So understanding uh, that broader context that comes with looking at a big picture issue is really um, at the heart of what um, they were getting at in this statement. You know, the lower part of the statement um, talks about how uh, management could be uh, affected through some one or more combinations of the following individual species, groups of species, or particular fisheries um, defined by area or gear. Uh, and these would be regulated quite specifically to try to maintain some form of balance in the species mix. So unfortunately, um, that proposal was not adopted um, by the council at the time. Uh, it went the traditional single species route uh, overall. Although I will say that prior to the implementation of the 200 mile limit, the under international jurisdiction on George's Bank through the International Commission on Northwest Atlantic Fisheries, a variant of this idea was actually uh, implemented starting in 1973 and was in place right up to the time uh, of the implementation of the 200 mile limit. And in that, there was an overall um, MSY, spec MSY specified for the entire Northeast continental shelf overall. And uh, then there were strategies devised to divide um, allocations both by nation and by species uh, such that they would not uh, exceed that overall production potential um, total. So one of the things, in a very real sense, we're going to build on that kind of a um, idea and try to return to it and see whether, in fact, it is feasible and what some of the potential weaknesses might be. We're going to do it in a slightly more refined way than I just described, however. Um, we're going to be trying to define uh, what you'll see in a moment as fishery functional groups. But here I'm showing a quote from colleague John Steele. Uh, he and I had been talking about issues related to the feasibility of looking at functional groups as management uh, units overall. And this is from a message that John sent me now quite a number of years ago. 
Um, and he's really highlighting that um, it's simply not an, a convenience either empirically or for management purposes, but these you know, functional groups are really at the heart and soul of how an ecosystem operates. And um, John felt quite strongly about this, and and um, and part of what I'll tell you coming up really deals with um, that as a guiding principle. So now we'll return. I'll turn to the issues, uh, the six major elements that we talked about um, at the beginning of the talk. And I want to tell you a little bit about how we've defined what we're calling ecological production units. So we've um, collected information uh, throughout the entire Northeast continental shelf. And um, some of you may know that that area from Cape Hatteras to the Gulf of Maine is designated as a large marine ecosystem under the, the NOAA uh, large LME program. Uh, we wanted to look at a f in, in finer detail, though, about some of the structure and basic uh, ecological properties uh, for this system to see whether there are effective dividing lines that we should consider in any management strategies. So basically, we assembled uh, several dozen uh, physiographic, hydrographic, and um, lower trophic level variables um, as inputs to an analysis, first doing a principal components analysis. Um, in this case, it explained about 75% of the variance overall in terms of the uh, spatial um, dynamics in this system. And then we applied a, a cluster analysis, k-means cluster analysis, to the PCA score. So we've tried there to deliberately uh, simplify the task under the uh, cluster analysis to try to help uh, delineate some of these areas. Um, so what you're looking at now, I just want to give you some of the uh, a view of some of the really key issues that really drove a lot of the results that we see. First of all, the, the white outlines you see, and I'm going to return to these in a moment, are the boundaries um, that we found in terms of identifying ecological production units. But there are at least four major things that stood out in terms of importance. In the upper left hand panel, you'll see uh, chlorophyll concentrations. A little bit later, I'll show you some primary production data. Um, the area now that I'm circling is George's Bank, Nantucket Shoals. And you see for areas offshore, it really stands apart by having two loci of very important uh, high productivity regions here identified at chlorophyll. You'll see the same message with the primary production overall. Um, this really is uh, due to some core issues that relate to the shallowness of these regions, uh, complete and strong tidal mixing throughout the area that uh, uh, serves to bring nutrients throughout the water column to, to fuel production. So that's one of the things that begins to set George's Bank apart. Um, now in the upper right, we're looking at temperature profiles. In all of these panels, I should point out that even though there are different metrics being shown, the warmer colors are higher values of each of them overall. So in the outer part of this picture, you see really the effect of the Gulf Stream and its influence on water temperatures overall. Again, on George's Bank, you'll see on the surface water, so these are SSTs, these are satellite-derived images, there's actually um, colder water over the areas that I've been identified as being high tidally mixed and actually somewhat colder at the surface uh, than the most adjacent areas of the Gulf of Maine. So the, the temperature um, factors on George's Bank, including Nantucket Shoals, have some features that are really strongly driven by the tidal mixing and the fact that we have, because of the shallowness, isothermal water masses throughout the area. In this lower left, you're looking at chlorophyll concentration uh, gradients. Again, this is one of the important parts, again, related to the mixing, but why we're seeing such high productivity on the bank and on Nantucket Shoals. And then finally, uh, SST gradients, where the main thing I want to draw your attention to is the importance of the shelf slope front here, the area that I'm outlining right now, um, which shows up as an important part of this overall story. So having gone through the um, exercise with the um, principal components analysis and cluster analysis, and uh, let me point out that we're using um, the units, the subunits within each of these are 10-minute um, rectangles. 
uh, on a side. So you can see you're looking at the edges of 10 minute rectangles here delineated. So there are four major areas that we've identified uh, in the um, lighter blue, the Mid-Atlantic Bight region. There's a core area in the central part here in the way we've co uh, collectively put together some of these uh, results and also the outer shelf where the shelf slope front influence is strong is separate and we're considering it a subregion and similarly the co immediate coastal area which you would have noticed in a number of fact um, of the observations we just looked at including the production estimates uh, pro uh, sorry chlorophyll um, estimates uh, are really much stronger near the coast. So this is one of the factors that results in that sort of delineation. On Georgia's Bank, we pick up the story in terms of a subregion that's related to the shelf slope front and then this uh, core principal area. In green, we have the Gulf of Maine with a, a central region uh, and uh, again, a coastal area as in the Mid-Atlantic Bight that has separate characteristics that might under certain circumstances be treated separately. And then largely in Canadian waters, but not exclusively, we have the Scotian Shelf uh, Ecological Production Unit in blue, which shows up quite distinct uh, from the other areas. But there is a part in U.S. waters on, on down east Maine um, they're a part of that. So actually, uh, the units that we've chosen have some uh, connection with earlier estimates um, that were drawn up under uh, Northeast Regional Ecosystem Plan. So consideration of ecosystem management precedes the, um, the dates that I mentioned in terms of the council activities. Uh, this is a, a chart show, uh, drawn up um, by expert opinion, but you'll see it has some uh, elements in common with what we found in our analysis, our, um, our statistical analysis, including the importance of the shelf slope front. Um, basically, uh, the delineation of George's Bank, not simply at the Northeast, uh, the Great South Channel that I mentioned earlier in the talk, but also extending further out and en encompassing and coming up to uh, Nantucket Shoals. And a midshore uh, and nearshore area as well. So, although it doesn't here delineate uh, the um, Canadian waters, that actually came up after uh, with the 1984 boundary dispute. Um, that, uh, but it didn't identify the Scotian Shelf as a separate area. But nonetheless, you can see some commonalities uh, using different approaches that that point. They're not exactly the same, of course, but they point to some similarities and recognition of the factors factors that are driving the production units overall. So next, I'm going to tell you briefly about this issue of modeling fishery production potential. We, we have done it, as I mentioned earlier, using network models, including Ecopath with Ecosim. Um, but here, for this purpose, we also developed a simpler model overall, where we're going to trace the flow of energy from the base of the food web um, through a number of steps and make an important distinction um, between uh, the, the microbial food web here in this lower left component and the fact that energy flow goes through several more steps uh, through this channel in terms before meeting at the nexus of the food web with mesozooplankton then does what we typically think of as the classical grazing food web where you have diatoms and larger dinoflagellates, the microplankton um, feeding up through not only the benthic communities but directly to the mesozooplankton. So the energy flow is quite different depending on the pathways and a large part of the nano and picoplankton go through the microbial food web before becoming available uh, to the upper trophic levels overall. Um, looking at um, primary production by these functional groups, uh, you'll see the microplankton production, the diatoms and larger um, um, plankton uh, primary producers here. Um, and again, the hot spots that we saw on George's Bank uh, in Nantucket Shoals show up again. Um, from this, this is all on a common scale. The nano and picoplankton you'll see right here is is dominant overall in terms of the amount of production going to the system on the order of something less than just uh, just less than 70 percent um, on average is being produced by the the uh, this functional group nano and picoplankton. So a lot of that energy is dissipated through the microbial food web, and that's important to understand in terms of under. Uh, thinking about how the flow of energy works and ultimately the production of harvestable species that are of interest to humans um, for food resources. 
Um, the model that I just showed you is implemented in a stochastic mode. Um, I'll go back for a moment and say that um, the uh, transfer efficiencies that are really indicated by these um, uh, arrows uh, really are um, taken as probability distributions rather than fixed values as they sometimes are in other models of this type. We uh, did a meta-analysis of over 100 different um, compiled food webs to get ideas of transfer efficiencies to these different parts of the system uh, and constructed probability distributions for those. Uh, we also have um, uh, prime, prober, excuse me, probability distributions for some of the splits between different components of the system, the split between uh, microplankton and mesozooplankton coming from the micro, uh, uh, going to the benthos from the microplankton and so on. So it is treated as a probabilist, probabilistic um, model. Uh, and here you're seeing some output from the model for different major functional groups in the system, uh, including the benthos, the benthivore categories, piscivores, and planktivores. <clears throat> so what you're looking at is typical box and whisker um, representation of the um, stochastic simulations that we've conducted. Uh, the main thing that I want to draw your attention to is that the median production potential for the bivalves in terms of live weight was on the order of 20 kilotons. Uh, and the median production potential for all the others um, was 220 uh, kilotons overall. Uh, when we partition that, uh, th these numbers, though, include both species that are currently exploited and those that are um, potentially exploited, and also all size classes. So um, it's a larger number than you might expect under our traditional treatments, and you need to keep that in mind. Um, but we have partitioned this out to um, currently uh, exploited species, and it's more on the order of 160 uh, kilotons overall for the estimated fishery production potential. So that currently is higher um, than about the uh, on the order of uh, 120,000 kilotons that we're getting for the catch on the bank right now, 120 kilotons on the bank. So that'll give you some idea of what we think we might expect. Now, the system overall, uh, of course, has been strongly affected, as I mentioned, by fishing. And so we're quite, in that previous uh, exercise, we we're really interested in looking at production potential, not simply uh, the situation under the current uh, productivity regime that we're dealing with where we are still recovering uh, and still experiencing uh, overfished uh, status for a number of the species. So the next topic I want to uh, pick up <clears throat> in the, the six uh, themes that I mentioned are this the identification of these fishery functional groups. And for our purposes, and here we're going to really try to deal with the species uh, the problems that come about with having both the technical and biological interactions operating in this system. So we're going to define fishery functional groups as species that are caught together. They have similar life history characteristics and play similar roles in the transfer of energy in the ecosystem. So here we're refining that overall approach that was um, mentioned um, earlier in my talk uh, concerning the recommendations from the task force. We're here, we're going to try to get a finer resolution and be able to exert uh, some greater control over different parts of the system than would be implicit in having just an overall system cap at play in, uh, in this um, on, the, on this uh, system. Um, <clears throat> we can think about these as stock complexes. I think most of you know that, uh, in fact, under Magnuson, um, we do have management that's now undergoing uh, under um, way in quite a number of parts of the country for management of uh, stock complexes. And they're really defined in ways that are uh, quite similar to some of the ones um, that I just mentioned for what we're going to, we're calling fishery functional groups. So for the purposes of connecting with what Magnuson says, we're really trying to get at the same idea of a functional uh, with a functional group as with um, the stock complexes. And also um, 
basically uh, a core element and related to the technical interactions is the fact that, as I mentioned, a number of our species cannot be targeted independently of one another. That's not to say that the fishers don't have, cannot exert some control, compositional control of the catch, but there are inherent limitations that have shown up in a number of different analyses of this problem overall. So we're really going to be talking about uh, assessing and managing on the basis of these functional groups, which here are connected with the stock complex idea. So in terms of this overall idea of looking at the species that are caught together, we have done, done in the past a number of analyses defining operational fisheries on George's Bank. Here I'm showing you just one uh, group for 10 autotrol fisheries uh, in the region on, on the bank itself <clears throat> and basically um, identifying that these range from uh, and here we're simply looking at some of the most important species that comprise the overall catch. Um, we have um, three of these that have a pretty substantial representation of uh, a broad array of species, so really highly multi um, species, uh, mixed species oriented. And then finally, for some others, ones that are really quite targeted on individual species, including ones that uh, relate here on this outer part, either on shrimp or on uh, the squids in the region. In terms of the part about the transfer of energy, um, there also have been quite a number of analyses done to try to define trophic gills. And that's an important part of the way we're viewing the problem. We're trading on some of these earlier analyses. And here I'm just showing one example as, as a um, prototypical approach using a cluster analysis based on food habits data, where here there are three major categories identified, benthivores, planktivores, and piscivores. And subdivisions uh, of, the, of the planktivores and piscivores are possible, depending on how finely you want to define uh, the overall structure. Um, but the main point is that we have objective ways of defining not only the species that are caught together, um, but the species that are uh, exhibiting uh, trophic interactions and are identified as playing similar roles in the ecosystem. And then finally, the last point uh, here is to deal with um, life history characteristics, because of course, one of the really important factors that emerges is that we have species with very different life history um, strategies that re differ uh, as a result, uh, that differ as a result in terms of their vulnerability to fishing. So here's a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling of a number of about almost a dozen life history attributes, including uh, factors such as uh, reproductive characteristics, the intrinsic rates of increase, um, basic growth characteristics of the species and so on. And we see a, a couple of main um, elements in this story. One is that we have one group uh, in this state space, uh, largely but not exclusively made up of the skate complexes, complex overall. You'll see there are some teleost in this group as well, but an important component of uh, really, this is really reflecting a major part of the skate complex. Here we have species in the teleost group uh, that have really, um, uh, faster life history characteristics, and then uh, scattering of other points, including uh, our species or stocks, including dogfish um, that have very distinct life history characteristics that, that point to the need to consider them uh, separately. Uh, we have halibut and redfish among the teleos with um, different um, vulnerabilities to fishing because of their, uh, in many cases, delayed reproduction and lower fecundity than some of the other species that we're talking about in this major teleost group. So uh, the, again, we're able to objectively look at some of the important factors that define the life history characteristics and potentially vulnerability to fishing and bring those into play into our, our definition of the um, functional groups overall. So now I want to tell you about some of the main elements of the management procedure. Um, again, this is really just a prelude to a much more detailed uh, management strategy evaluation. So I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of detail, but I am going to show you some results um, to kind of set the stage for some of the things we've found so far.
and looking at this. Uh, and first, so here's a pictorial representation of what I'll tell you uh, listed on, on the right-hand side. Again, we're going to set uh, an overall ceiling or cap on the catches here based largely on the basis of target exploitation rates and estimated biomass levels, but also informed by the um, production potential estimates that we've had um, that, we, that I showed uh, just a bit earlier. Um, You'll see that immediately if we just uh, specified caps on the catches that it'd be possible quite easily to overexploit components of the functional groups um, for some of the reasons I was just mentioning, differences in life history characteristics and also because of the intrinsic value, uh, economic value of different species differs, um, that there would be um, an attempt to uh, take the high valued species and probably discard a number of the lower valued ones. So. Um, for that reason, we need to set a constraint uh, on uh, defining low, what we're calling floors or minimum biomass levels below which a species or stock is considered to be depleted. Um, that level can differ among different species depending again on their life history characteristics, uh, but it's one of the safeguards that we're implementing overall in terms of um, uh, this overall approach so that we have, uh, we hope, uh, measures in place that will conform to both Magnuson and uh, also the uh, national standard guidelines. Um, we're going to, uh, one of the key things of the options that we're considering uh, in terms of remedial action is that, um, and you'll see the harvest control rule in a moment, but uh, if biomass uh, drops below a trigger or a threshold level um, for a species or a functional group, um, we're going to implement reductions in exploitation on the complex as a whole before, before the floor is reached. So again, this is in recognition of the fact that even though um, there may be a, a limited number of species that are um, uh, deemed to be in trouble. We could have problems if we don't allow fishing on other compart parts of the system uh, that uh, co-occur with the species in trouble. So we want to, at least as one of the options, understand uh, the performance of that as a uh, measure, as, a, as an important component of what we want to look at in terms of conservative management. Uh, and then we'll talk about simulating the um, in the management procedure performance overall. So for this purpose, I'm going to tell you about um, some simulations that have been done with Hydra. Uh, we're going to be looking at a simplified food web with only 10 species. Um, all of these are managed either solely or jointly by the New England Fishery Management Council, with the exception of Atlantic mackerel, which is managed by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Uh, but it's so important overall in terms of the food web dynamics that we've included it in this uh, analysis overall. So some uh, quick points about Hydra as an operating model. Uh, again, it has 10 species and it's broken down into two elasmobranchs, three pisivores, two planktivores, and three benthivores. It's a size structured rather than age structured model because we do have size uh, information on all the species uh, among the 10 that we're talking about and much more broadly as well. Um, we're looking at size specific predation mortality rates within Hydra. And the model is set up to allow for environmental covariates on growth, maturity, and fecundity. Uh, we have a number of different choices for recruitment functions within Hydra. Um, and so we can choose among them as different options and look at the performance under different kinds of um, choices for, for the recruitment dynamics uh, in the system. The model currently has three fleets, including um, bottom and pelagic trawls and fixed gear. Uh, but we're in, in the process of adding two more uh, fleets to the model and also three more species, but that work is now underway and not completed. Um, and we're going to be deriving size-specific fishing mortality rates from this information. Um, the model um, is implemented by Sarah Gages in ADMB, uh, and at the moment it's in a sim we're using for simulation, so as a, in this uh, operating model uh, mode overall, but it is, there are plans and analyses that have been undertaken to look at it as an estimation model as well. And then, of course, we're going to focus on the fishery functional groups to account for the technical and biological interactions. 
So some core elements of uh, Hydra in terms of the um, flow of um, mo the model flow um, in getting through this cycle. Uh, we're looking at, we're drawing on information from surveys, catch sampling, uh, data, oceanography, fishing effort and fishing um, um, process processes overall that are coming in as data sources to the model. Um, we, uh, Hydra is a multi-species um, fishery model, simulation model, again with a recruitment module, growth and condition modules, consumption modules to estimate the predation rates, and fleet sector and fishery selectivity modules. So these are, many of these are parameterized in ways that will be familiar to many of you working in multi-species modeling. Um, this then passes simulated data out um, into the, the process where we're looking at um, biomass, size composition, mortality rates, both natural, uh, other mortality, predation mortality, fishing mortality, and catch estimates. Uh, it is then passed to an assessment module where we're doing simulated assessments. And here, because of some of the restrictions on the nature of the data that we have, we're looking at a number of different simplified multi-species assessment models that do include multi-species production models and multi-species delay difference models. And we're looking at these not at the individual species level for when we get to this stage, but really at a functional group level. Um, from these assessments, we're devising uh, ecosystem reference points, which can also be informed by the satellite primary production estimate, and then uh, looking at the efficacy of, diff of different harvest control rules. So the harvest control rules that we're looking at um, uh, can be viewed in this way. There's a couple twists to the normal story. First of all, as I mentioned, the exploitation rates that we're looking at are implemented at a functional group level, not at the individual species level. Uh, in contrast, the biomass or uh, on a, uh, the biomass reference points are implemented both at the functional group level and at the individual species group level, and you'll see that in a moment. Um, we also have different cut points, decision points, trigger points and threshold for and more um, precautionary ones for species that we deem to be vulnerable because of their life history characteristics. Uh, and one of the important things here uh, relative to what we're currently doing in terms of multi-species management on the bank is to have a ramp down strategy as an integral part of this. So once a trigger point um, is reached, then we begin to reduce the fishing pressure on the functional group as a whole in an attempt to restore it before it ever reaches some of these um, threshold points where fishing would be stopped. So that's the basic idea that we're um, looking at um, in terms of performance metrics. We're looking at the biomass, both by species and functional group, revenues, so to bring in parts of the important story on the human side. Um, by species and functional groups, species diversity, looking at the species uh, depletion index and also a functional group depletion index. So this is when either species or functional groups uh, fall below the threshold values that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we wanna look at uh, the maintenance uh, overall in terms of the size composition and structure of the population. So we have a big fish index that we're using to, to mark um, where we are in terms of the size composition overall in the catch. Again, this is with the idea of maintaining sufficiently robust size structures um, that will have important influences overall in terms of the um, reproductive output and yields in the system. We're looking again at the human side, the stability of the landings, and another, mention, another look at um, ecosystem structure or system overall structure in terms of the ratio of different functional groups. I'm gonna show you a figure in a moment that has some but not of all these represented. I didn't wanna crowd the diagram too much. Um, we basically have, um, here I'm gonna show you some radar plots that summarize the um, results from the simulations overall. And the uh, of the response variables we're looking at, we're gonna go, uh, look, uh, starting at, at the 12 o'clock position at revenue, functional group status, the species status, landings, biomass, stability of landings, 
the large fish index in, uh, in the population and in the uh, landings overall. So this upper tier looks at what happens when we only implement uh, restrictive management when that um, threshold uh, level is reached. So it's really the extreme case. Um, in the lower panel, the lower tier, we're going to show what happens when we implement the ramped ramp down once a trigger is point uh, reached. So the important thing you need to know in interpreting these are in these radar plots is that it's better to be on the outer um, part of the octagon here overall it's showing higher performance overall and the colors are representing increasingly higher uh, uh, fishing more exploitation rates as you go from the dark blues uh, to the reds overall so a couple things that emerge uh, here and just to uh, tell you a bit about the uh, what the columns represent here um, we're looking at that threshold strategy implemented just at the functional group level. Uh, this is the more conservative approach where we uh, implement it at the species level. And here we have species uh, with the extra protection afforded uh, for vulnerable species overall. And in this case, it really is uh, just winter skate and, um, and spiny dogfish that fit into that category. Um, so that's the basic structure of the radar plots. You'll see basically that here, um, when we work with the, the threshold strategy overall, or what's designated here as uh, fixed rate, then basically um, the resilience to exploitation is really um, quite low. And as we ramp up from uh, 0 0.05 exploitation rate to um, 0.4, um, then we're really down in, uh, in each of these cases in quite um, uh, depleted circumstances in poor performance on all the metrics overall. In contrast, when we look at the ramped rate, um, we're able to maintain much greater resilience overall. So you can see we don't shrink down uh, to that same level. There still obviously is an effect on having the higher exploitation rates overall. Um, but one of the main things that emerges from these initial calculations is really the central importance of having um, the ramp down or putting the brakes on an early strategy in place for, for this uh, approach overall. It really pays important dividends in terms of maintaining the resilience of the system overall. In terms and practice of uh, determining the depleted status, we can do this both not only obviously in the simulations, but in real world data by defining a lower threshold and then basically counting the times that the time series from surveys in this case fall below that, that threshold. So we can get an idea in practice about <clears throat> how things are playing out in the real world by implementing a strategy of this type. And, and here, although we're not limited to using survey data, um, basically the key um, uh, common factor that we have for most of the species really is the survey index. Uh, for species that do get depleted, particularly under the um, threshold strategy, uh, we can put, put in place further measures including targeted area closures and that will help species with high habitat fidelity particularly. We could put in species specific uh, annual catch limits to further restrict uh, any catch uh, of those species, including catch, uh, landings and discards, um, further effort to the restrictions, conservation engineering solutions. And one last point that I'll mention is a different way of thinking about the problem altogether. In terms of allocating catches in terms of biomass, the way we typically uh, have done, uh, we can assign instead point allocations um, for the system overall, where we have differential points at um, assigned to different species depending on their current status. And so basically what this is telling you, this uh, being depicted here is that in fact species that are in depleted or low abundance um, condition would cost a harvester more points um, to take uh, than would one that's in higher condition. So these are just some examples now reflecting some current conditions overall in our system. But here, uh, this is a way to try to incentivize um, really directing uh, fishing pressure towards species um, that are in robust condition and away from those um, 
that are in trouble. So it's just another way of trying to deal with that overall problem. And then finally, I'll just um, end with um, an important measure that or, or lesson that emerges from all of this, and, and it's really um, understanding that we can't continue on uh, in the future in the way we have in the past. There was a number of years ago a very important post-mortem on the uh, success or lack thereof of ground fish management in New England, uh, written by the first director of the New England Fishery Management Council and one of its first and more prominent um, council members, Jake Dykstra. Uh, and they lay out their view of the problem uh, that really emerged with the uh, ground fish um, uh, difficulties that really have proven to be an intractable problem using conventional fisheries management. So I'll close there and ask if there are questions. Thank you, Michael. Uh, a great presentation. We have um, a little bit of time, um, and I just want to assess, we have definitely one question here in Silver Spring and two online. Uh, some of them may be a little in depth, and we would again recommend, perhaps Mike, you could address them offline uh, with the the folks that have posed the question. But we'll start here in Silver Spring, and maybe you mind coming up and. So, Mike, just um, tell us who you are. Hi, Mike. This is Liz Chilton from Office of Science and Technology. Um, so glad you brought up performance metrics, and I've been watching the development of this whole process, and I'm very excited about it. I'm particularly interested about the performance metrics of revenue and landing stability from the perspective of um, what kind of feedback have you received from the fish houses? Are they possible, willing, able to take that mix of um, target in a single delivery for the type of processing they're doing? Has that been part of the consideration? Yeah, it is an important issue overall, Liz. There are a couple of um, initiatives underway actually to broaden the base of um, resources that are used. So basically, you know, what we want to do is think about this as managing a portfolio and having and maintaining a diverse portfolio. And the more species that can be brought into this mix to um, both uh, produce um, yield and revenue, but also perhaps shield some of the other species uh, is pretty important part of the story. So. Uh, among the initiatives here uh, to get uh, people working with what might be considered less commonly utilized species are the community supported fisheries initiatives in the region where they do um, bring uh, to their um, members species that, that um, they might not see in the marketplace or at least not prominently so and have them try them. And also um, there is an important program run out of Rhode Island called Eating with the Ecosystem that tries to um, really broaden the base uh, and really uh, I think uh, serves an important purpose in trying to diversify in the way that um, we're trying to encourage in this overall. So to spread the burden more, but have much lower fishing rates overall on any one individual component. So those are just a couple of the initiatives that are underway, um, uh, but it will it is important. It's not a trivial issue overall in terms of thinking about uh, markets and marketability. Um, and that definitely does have to be considered. Thank you, Michael. Um, we have two questions online. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the question, but you may need to take them offline. Uh, one is from Melissa Rhodes Reese, and the question simply is, has the uh, uh, Northeast uh, Fishery Science Center, Center considered including large vertebrates into the energy equations to more uh, accurately represent ecosystem processes? Yeah, so um, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, we uh, the full network models do include um, uh, the uh, large vertebrates, and there are a number of important um, ones in this area. Some of which are are in trouble, um, both on on the uh, cetacean side and uh, particularly with the right whales. Uh, and also, we have an explosion of of pinnipeds. Uh, in the area. So yes, we are uh, in other modeling activities looking at the um, uh, the role that these species are playing in the system. Um, <clears throat> the one, the um, 
the model that I showed for the purposes of looking at the production potential uh, really dealt with trying to see what would be available to all parts of the ecosystem potentially if we were dealing with a strictly bottom-up controlled system. So uh, one of the decisions that would be made in that case, if you look at the, just that simpler model, is the partitioning between um, the resources that would be need to be left um, for vertebrates in general, uh, not only the, the, um, uh, the mammals, uh, but also the birds. Okay, great, Michael. And just one more. Um, from Alida Sotomayor, uh, all these metrics and relationships in the Georgian Bank uh, fishery, did you have them from the beginning or are they being developed for the BFM approach? Well, we assembled them specifically for this approach. We had the uh, available information to do it from the beginning and, and that helped uh, inform some of the decisions we made along the way. Um, but they weren't being put out, uh, all of them were not, certainly not being put out uh, in the form that I um, alluded to um, just now in terms of what we'd use in terms of really measuring performance. So to go back to the original statement about um, what we're trying to accomplish with EBFM and the issue of resilience, a number of them you'll recognize do relate to the um, issue of resilience and we'd want to bring those forward so currently, um, we do deal with an extraction-oriented um, objective system, albeit one that does have important considerations of overall sustainability, but it focuses pretty strongly on extraction through the, you know, that it's inherent in the MSY uh, strategy. Um, but here we want to broaden that focus and really bring in more of the resilience angle. Okay, great, Mike. We have one more comment from Dennis Feynman at the Marine Mammal Commission, and we'll just send that to you directly. It's just okay. a comment on, on available information. And okay. so, again, Michael, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate all your efforts and time in putting this together. Great presentation. Uh, we have a wonderful turnout online and here in Silver Spring. So, again, thank you so much. Uh, for our next seminar on October 9th, same time, our speaker will be Jamil. Mori from our Northwest Fishery Science Center. The title of his talk, An Ecosystem-Based Risk Assessment for California Fisheries, co-developed by scientists, managers, and stakeholders. So stay tuned, join us again, and again, thanks to everyone who joined us today. I appreciate that, and thanks to the NOAA Library again for hosting us. So Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.